thank you. Are we settled? Can we start? Yes? Thank you very much. Um, we are now embarking on the third hearing this morning, and this is the, about the right to freedom of association, peaceful assembly, and freedom of expression in the United States. This um, hearing was requested by Civicus, a center for not-for-profit law, charity, and security network. Um, each side will have 15 minutes for the initial presentation. And um, if I, would, I could ask you to identify yourselves as you speak. I will try to give you an intimation when you reach. You only have five minutes left, three minutes, and one minute with these flyers. And with that, let me waste no further time and invite you to start. Thank you. We would like to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for granting us this hearing on freedom of association, peaceful assembly, and expression in the United States at its 166th ordinary period of sessions. We recognize and appreciate the presence of the Honorable Commissioners, the President of the Commission, and the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. My name is Bobby Jo Trout, and I represent Civicus, the World Alliance for Citizen Participation. And I am joined by three presenters. Andrea Hall from the Charity and Security Network, Nick Robinson from the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, and Elizabeth Lagesse, a J-20 criminal defendant and plaintiff in a civil, civil liberties lawsuit against the DC Metropolitan Police, all of whom will be presenting shortly. Civicus is an international network of over 3,000 members strengthening citizen action and civil society throughout the world. Since May 2016, Civicus and its research partner, Charity and Security Network, have monitored and reported on the situation for civic space in the US. Based on our findings, Civicus would like to express its growing concern over narrowing civic space in the country, as presented in our written, in our written submission to the commission. The US is currently rated in the narrowed category of countries on the Civicus Monitor, which is an online collaborative research tool tracking civic space developments in 195 countries. This is worrisome as narrowing civic space indicates the state is not fulfilling its duty to protect citizens' rights to organize, protest, and express themselves without fear. Based on our research findings, Civicus is particularly concerned with the following three threats to these civic freedoms. First, regulations that hinder certain groups and organizations from exercising their full right to freedom of association. Second, legal restrictions on citizens' protest rights and the criminalization of protesters that in some cases has disproportionately targeted excluded groups. Third, harmful state rhetoric against the media and arbitrary arrests of journalists that create a climate of public distrust of the media and fear among media workers. In the interest of time, we have chosen to focus on freedom of association and peaceful assembly at this hearing. My colleagues will present more in-depth information on threats to these two civic freedoms, as well as provide a first-hand account of protest rights violations. Thank you for your attention, and I'll turn the time over to my colleague, Andrea Hall, to present first. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. My name is Andrea Hall, and I represent the Charity and Security Network, a resource center for nonprofit organizations to promote and protect their ability to carry out effective programs. In recent years, access to financial services has become increasingly difficult for nonprofit organizations based in the U.S. that must conduct international financial transactions in order to operate abroad. Financial institutions may delay or refuse to make transfers between organizations. Sometimes nonprofits are turned away as customers or have their accounts closed. Our report, published in February, established that these financial access problems are systemic, global, and require urgent action by multilateral organizations, government, financial institutions, and nonprofits. The ability to seek, secure, and use resources is essential to the existence and effective operation of all associations. The failure of the U.S. government to facilitate financial access for U.S. nonprofits violates their obligations under international law to respect and enable freedom of association. Reports of nonprofit problems with access to financial services began surfacing a decade ago, and the problem has only gotten worse. While it initially appeared to mainly impact Muslim charities, over time it has spread to include many types of organizations. Our report, Financial Access for U.S. Nonprofits, is based on the first ever empirical study of the problem as it relates to U.S.-based nonprofits that work in foreign countries. 
Among the report's major findings, two-thirds of all U.S. nonprofits that work abroad are having financial access difficulties. Delay in wire transfers, which can last up to several months, are the most common problem, affecting 37 percent of organizations. One-third of nonprofits have experienced fee increases, and a quarter have faced additional unusual documentation requests. Transfers to all parts of the globe are impacted. The problem is not limited to conflict zones or fragile and failing states. Delays in the transfer of funds impact time-sensitive programming. Because most nonprofits are small, fee increases and extra resources needed to manage information requests hinder their ability to conduct their work. Although account closures and refusals to open them are less common than transfer delays, they can have an extraordinary impact, particularly when no explanation or opportunity to correct perceived problems is offered. A forced account closure can create shockwaves throughout an organization, sending personnel frantically searching for new banking services. And once an organization has an account closed, other banks may be reluctant to accept the nonprofit as a new customer. Excuse me, um, the translate, translation fits. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, slow. it's worth noting that nonprofits express, express full support for the objectives underlying U.S. counterterrorism financing laws and sanctions policies, as their programs and staff can be impacted by terrorism as well. But trying to operate in the de-risking environment creates tensions with their state admissions. Recognition of the unintended consequences of AML CFT policies by U.S. officials has been tepid. As the president of the Financial Action Task Force stated in a blog published this week, it is ultimately up to jurisdictions, their regulators, and financial institutions to put the risk-based approach into practice. In an effort to craft solutions, the World Bank and the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists launched a multi-stakeholder dialogue earlier this year with banks, nonprofits, and government officials. Several work streams have emerged from that process. A proposed revision of the manual used in all bank examinations was sent to regulators with the hope that these changes will be made. However, efforts to standardize bank information requests and other projects are somewhat stalled. As detailed in our written submission, we respectfully ask the Commission to encourage the U.S. government to take the following steps. Institute state safe harbor protections, improve implementation of the risk-based approach, develop clear guidance standards to reduce guesswork and compliance costs, promote transparency, information sharing, and proportionality to recalibrate risk perception, create incentives to encourage appropriate risk management. Thank you, and I turn this over to my colleague, Nick Robinson. Um, so I want to thank the Honorable Commissioners for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Nick Robinson. I'm a legal advisor for the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, where I coordinate our U.S. program. ICNL works in 100 countries globally uh, to strengthen the legal environment for civil society and advance the freedoms of association, assembly, and expression. Uh, in my remarks, I will focus on some of the current challenges that we see to the right to peaceful assembly in the United States. In our submission, uh, we highlight several ways that law enforcement and government's response to demonstrations chill or restrict this right. I will mention just three. First, law enforcement's response to protests has become increasingly militarized, including the use of full body armor, assault weapons, and armored trucks. This situation has been exacerbated by the transfer of military weapons from the federal government to local law enforcement. Uh, while President Obama scaled back this transfer program through an executive order after the events in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, President Trump reversed that order in August of this year. Second, we have too often witnessed the use of excessive force uh, by police against demonstrators. These tactics include police in riot gear corralling and trapping protesters in a tactic known as kettling, spraying protesters with chemical agents without proper warning, and interfering with the right of demonstrators to film protests. Third, law enforcement and prosecutors have aggressively arrested and brought charges against pro protesters. Elizabeth Lajez um, will be speaking in more detail after me about her personal experiences at the J20 protests, where federal prosecutors have pursued a strategy of collective liability against protesters. The challenges to protesters are not only, uh, not only coming from the response of law enforcement and prosecutors, but also through state-level legislation and executive orders. Since November 2016, 27 states have considered 49 bells um, that restrict the right to protest. Eight of these bells have been enacted, and 26 are awaiting further consideration. 
This legislation includes provisions that would apply disproportionate penalties for unlawful activity commonly related to protests, like creating a public nuisance, as well as eliminating civil liability for drivers who hit protesters if the drivers are exercising due care. State governors have repeatedly used emergency powers in the context of protests. In many cases, this use is arguably unnecessary or not sufficiently tailored to the needs of the situation. We believe uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights can play a fruitful role in helping the United States confront these challenges. This role includes creating and disseminating principles on protecting the freedom of assembly, something we understand uh, that the Commission's Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression is already undertaking, and thank him for that. We also respectfully ask uh, that the, uh, the Commission convene a meeting with governments and civil society across the region to facilitate the sharing of best practices in managing peaceful protests. In our submission, we respectfully ask the U.S. government to undertake several suitable measures to address our concerns. These include ensuring law enforcement is properly trained to manage demonstrations, more tightly limiting and regulating the transfer of military weapons to local law enforcement, working to ensure prosecutors seek proportionate penalties for protesters who violate the law, working to reject uh, or amend state legislation that violates the right to peaceful assembly, and ensuring that state and local emergency powers are not abused in the context of protests. I turn next to Elizabeth. First of all, thank you to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for this opportunity to share my experiences. I am currently facing multiple criminal charges related to protests um, surrounding President Trump's inauguration, including rioting, inciting a riot, and conspiracy to riot. Together, these charges carry a maximum of more than 60 years in prison. I am also a plaintiff in a lawsuit brought by the American Civil Liberties Union alleging police misconduct connected to the same events. On the morning of Inauguration Day, I plan to make a political point, as I have at many other protests. But shortly after arriving in Washington, I was swept up in an indiscriminate mass arrest along with over 230 protesters, journalists, and legal observers. The U.S. Attorney for D.C., part of the Department of Justice, indicted most of those arrested on unprecedented felony charges. Since January, prosecutors have aggressively pursued these cases, portraying political organizing as criminal conspiracy. They seized data from at least 100 defendant cell phones and issued digital search warrants criticized by civil liberties groups as a gross invasion of privacy. Throughout months of preliminary hearings, prosecutors have failed to provide individualized evidence for each defendant. Instead, they've based their cases on a broad theory of guilt by association. For example, prosecutors freely admit to having no evidence that I personally damaged property or harmed anyone. Yet, I also face five counts of felony property destruction associated with the alleged conspiracy to riot, based on little more than the fact that I was arrested. Unlike the vast majority of US criminal cases, which end in a plea deal, most of my co-defendants have chosen to take their cases to trial. Unfortunately, most will also wait more than a year for their day in court, under the constant threat of decades in prison. Many have lost jobs, experienced financial hardship, or become estranged from their families. But crucially, the disruption in our lives serves as a threat to all. Would the average person choose to protest if they knew they could face years of legal battles? Although I experienced several of the troubling police practices discussed earlier, it seems clear that it's these heavy-handed prosecutions that are perhaps even a greater threat to dissent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the representatives of the state, please, 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Distinguished commissioners, 
civil society friends and secretariat colleagues. My name is Genevieve Libanati, and I am the acting deputy chief of mission of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. I would like to thank the civil society groups for their presentation. We also thank the commission's special rapporteur for freedom of expression, Mr. Edison Lanza, for his participation in this hearing. I will start with a few general remarks, then turn the floor over to my colleague for more specifics on the United States' strong and long-standing freedom of expression, legal protections, and international engagement on these issues. It goes without saying that, we w um, that while we have heard some very interesting viewpoints today, we are gathered today in a country with one of the most vibrant media hubs in the world and certainly very strong and long-standing protections for freedom of association, freedom of expression, and the right of peaceful assembly, which are all protected by the U.S. Constitution. Democratic societies are not infallible, but they are accountable, and the exchange of ideas is the foundation for open and transparent governance. In the United States, and in many places around the world, the press fosters active debate provides investigative reporting, and serves as a forum to express different points of view, particularly on behalf of those who are marginalized in society. The United States commends journalists around the world for the important role they play and for their commitment to the free exchange of ideas. Throughout the hemisphere, the United States has been a strong supporter of freedom of expression. In fact, we are the single largest contributor of voluntary funds to the Commission's Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression and to the Commission in general. We provide roughly $2.5 million a year. We have also stood up in strong support of the rapporteurship when other member states attempted to undermine its mandate and functions. We will continue to play a critical role in the hemisphere in support of key initiatives to promote and protect freedom of expression in the Americas. At this time, I will turn the floor over to Ms. Lynn Sicade, who is the Acting Director of the Office of Multilateral Affairs in our Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor Bureau at the Department of State for a broader discussion of these issues. Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Libyan, Ms. Libanati. I always do that with your name, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Um, distinguished commissioners, thank you for convening this hearing and for furthering the work of civil society by providing them a forum in which their voices can be heard. Special Rapporteur Lanza, thank you for your continued work on the promotion and protection to the right of freedom of expression in the Americas. To the civil society representatives, your ongoing efforts to promote respect and the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms both in the United States and around the world are both courageous and much appreciated. The work of civil society is critical to the functioning of every democratic society. You have candidly and thoughtfully shared your concerns about the current status of civic space in the United States. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak about the protection of freedom of expression, association, and peaceful assembly in my country. These are essential elements of our democracy and of our republic, and these are rights that every American holds dear. In my remarks today, I will provide the Commission and those attending and watching this hearing with general information about freedom of expression, association, and peaceful assembly in the United States. These core values Americans um, share are embedded in our foundational document, the Constitution of the United States. Protecting these rights from government infringement was central to shaping the design of U.S. government. Our government's framers sought to do this by limiting the power of national government vis-a-vis -vis the constituent states and by breaking up the power of the national government between three separate co-equal branches. At the same time, many strongly believed that individual freedoms could not be sufficiently safeguarded unless they were spelled out in our Constitution itself. This was done through the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights. From the beginning, our government's framers foresaw that delicate and constant balancing would be required to ensure that the exercise of government power did not threaten the rights it was meant to protect. The federal executive branch has played a role by enforcing laws and judicial decisions and also through its own actions. 
By 1946, the unwillingness or inability of state officials to uphold the civil rights of racial minorities and the weakness of existing federal statutes had led to increasing demands for new legislation to strengthen the powers of national government. President Truman appointed a special committee on civil rights whose mandate was to determine whether and in what respect current law enforcement measures and the authority and means possessed by federal, state, and local governments may be strengthened and improved to safeguard the civil rights of the people. The committee's report prompted President Truman's executive orders ending racial discrimination in the federal government employment and desegregating the military. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution adopted after the U.S. Civil War established U.S. congressional authority to pass laws to enforce individual rights vis-a-vis -vis the states. In the 1950s and 60s, Congress used this power to enact significant and far-reaching civil rights legislation, including creation of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. While we note civil society stated concerns about the current status of civic space in the United States, we believe it is also helpful to consider the present situation in its historical context. In the 20th century, U.S. society experienced periods of intense divisiveness, particularly in the 1960s and 70s. Those periods were marked by a significant expansion in the use of civic space. Individual activists and ordinary citizens either formed new civic organizations or joined with established ones to gather, demonstrate, protest, and make their voices heard in a wide variety of fora through a wide variety and range of media. These groups and individuals represented a diversity of interests, viewpoints, and objectives, including advocating for or against government policies relating to the civil rights of minorities, women, social issues, and national security. Their speech ranged from polite to vitriolic. Their activities ranged from pleasant and orderly to unruly and chaotic. They employed both legal and extra-legal means. Events during these periods underscored the delicate balance between the free exercise of individual liberties and the exercise of government power to ensure safety and security. It was these periods of intense divisiveness and self-examination that affirmed the resiliency of U.S. society and ultimately enhanced the capacity of our governmental system to uphold individual rights. During this time, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized that the First Amendment protected the right to freedom of association, though not explicitly spelled out in the text of the Constitution. It further held that such a right is fundamental, protected from infringement by both the federal government and the governments of the U.S. states. This jurisprudence was developed in response to attempts by some states to restrict the activities of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In a 1958 case involving the state of Alabama, the court explained that um, effective advocacy of both public and private points of view, particularly controversial ones, is undeniably enhanced by group association and linked to the freedom of association uh, and linked freedom of association to the First Amendment's freedom of speech and peaceful assembly. The court said that it is immaterial whether the beliefs sought to be advanced by association pertain to political, economic, religious, or cultural matters, and state action, which may have the effect of curtailing the freedom to associate, is subject to the closest scrutiny. The Supreme Court has defined the rights of, to freedom of speech and peaceful assembly broadly. There are rel relatively few limits on what individuals in the United States can say or on when or where or how they can say it. Unless speech is determined through applicable legal tests to be obscene, child pornography, incitement to imminent violence, or a true threat of violence, it is protected by the First Amendment. In 1989, the Supreme Court held that the First Amendment protected a protester who burned the U.S. flag during a public demonstration. The court emphasized if there is a bedrock principle under, underlying the First Amendment, it is that government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. The corollary is also true. Those, including officials of the government, as well as private citizens, who find such behavior offensive and disagreeable 
have a right to say so and to associate and assemble with others who also agree. What they cannot do is use law enforcement powers of the government to suppress expression they find offensive. In a similar way, the Supreme Court has broadly defined the right to peaceful, peaceful assembly sorry, um, to include political meetings, marches, sit-ins, protests, ra and rallies before government buildings, gatherings in a public park, group boycotts, labor pickets, filing lawsuits, and lobbying the government. The use of public spaces and streets for communication of views on matters of public concern may not be abridged or denied solely because the government actor fears, dislikes, um, or disagrees with those, the views of those persons uh, present. Such use is, however, subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions based on a three-part test. The restriction must be justified without reference to content. It must be na narrowly tailored to serve a significant governmental interest, and it must leave open ample alternative channels for communication of the information. Government officials are also limited in their discretion to decide whether or not to approve a demonstration permit. In 1977, a federal court determined that the city of Skokie, Illinois, had violated the First Amendment by enacting ordinances intended to limit the American Nazi Party's ability to march in Skokie, which was the home of many Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. But you can imagine, this was an extremely emotional case. These ordinances included restrictions on dissemination of hate literature and the wearing of military uniforms that they required insurance and permits to be purchased prior to marching. One judge reasoned, in finding that the Nazis had the right to march, that it is better to allow those who preach racial hatred to expend their venom in rhetoric rather than to be panicked into embarking on the dangerous course of permitting the government to decide what citizens may say and hear. In the United States, we have always believed that sunlight is the best disinfectant for hate speech. There are numerous rationales for guaranteeing respect for and protection of open civic space. One is to ensure citizens are informed and able to meaningfully participate in political decision making and to hold their governments accountable. accountable. Another is to foster resilient, stable societies by ensuring outlets for airing the grievances and, for, and allowing people to have their voices heard. Yet another is to promote tolerance by ensuring there is space for the broadest possible diversity of voices, viewpoints, values, interests, and ideas. There is also the view that open, open civic space facilitates debate and competition among those with divergent views and ideas regarding facts, opinions, and lies, with the hope and expectation that the truth will ultimately prevail. If we consider the current situation of civic space in the United States in this light, we see that all these things are indeed happening. Individuals and organizations continue to have access to an overwhelming amount of news, reporting, opinion, editorial pieces, blog, social media posts, and other information from an incredibly large and diverse number of sources, both domestic and global. Many individuals and organizations are themselves the creators, hosts, and or disseminators of content. Much of this content is specifically focused on governmental policies on a range of issues, as well as the conduct, past and present, of elected and appointed officials at all levels and in all branches of government. Multiple and diverse voices continue to make themselves heard daily on a wide range of topics from a broad spectrum of viewpoints and in a variety of fora and through a variety of media. All of this fuels the intense, ongoing discourse so vital to the proper functioning and strength of US society and ultimately of our democracy itself. Again, all people have the same right to take advantage of this space and to criticize those who criticize them. The US has long viewed freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly as belonging to every individual which is why we prioritize the opening of civic space in our foreign policy. In the United Nations, the US leads on freedom of expression. 
We were the main sponsor beyond, behind the creation of the mandate of the Rapporteur on Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association at the Human Rights Council. At the UN General Assembly in the Third Committee this past November, we were pleased once again to sponsor the resolution on human rights defenders and the resolution on safety of journalists uh, <laughs> with respect to the issue of impunity. Here at the OAS, we strongly support General Assembly resolutions which address freedom of expression and association issues. In addition to our historic support for the IACHR's work on human rights, defenders, and freedom of expression, we also actively promote and support the registration of credible civil society organizations to participate in OAS events, ministerials, and in the Summit of America processes. In closing, I would like to emphasize that it is the privilege of the United States to work with civil society actors to promote and protect freedom of expression, association, and assembly abroad. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Madam. Um, I call <coughs> on Commissioner Oresco for his intervention. Gracias, Presidenta. También agradecer a la digna representación de las organizaciones solicitantes, así como a la digna delegación de los ilustres Estados Unidos su participación en esta importante audiencia. Seguramente la propia relatora de país, mis colegas, el relator Edison Lanza tendrán eh, preguntas relevantes. Yo me eh, quisiera concentrar en, en un aspecto, si bien es ampliamente reconocido la, la fortaleza del marco constitucional y legal de los Estados Unidos en favor de los derechos de eh, libertad de expresión, reunión pacífica y asociación, así como las vigorosas decisiones judiciales a las que se ha hecho referencia, eh, eh, también recibimos con preocupación los comentarios que se hace, de la información que nos proporcionan acerca de algunos eh, eh, casos de eh, violencia policial, acoso en relación con eh, eh, el ejercicio particularmente del derecho a la a, de reunión y manifestación. Eh, 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 y eh, eh, yo les consultaría si cuál sería en los casos específicos eh, la respuesta que hubiese habido eh, por parte del, del Poder Judicial, en conc concretamente en su caso, y también eh, 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 recibimos con preocupación, eh, 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 particularmente ese, el, el lo que nos mencionan del, de los hechos ocurridos el día de la inauguración, ¿verdad?, y que se llegaron, se nos… Eh, eh, informa a incluso a aplicar algún tipo penal como el de eh, conspiración. Se mencionaba si hubiese habido algunos otros, a qué tipos penales se llegan a pretender aplicar en este, eh, en este tipo de asuntos que, le, que nos compartieran en cuanto a la criminalización de, de, de manifestantes y eh, eh, también acerca de, la, eh, de las eh, iniciativas de ley, incluso algunas que se han aprobado, que eh, se considera que eh, eh, pues no estarían satis, eh, eh, haciendo los, los estándares internacionales de legalidad, eh, eh, necesidad y proporcionalidad en cuanto al uso de la fuerza eh, 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 por parte del Estado. Y si eh, 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 nos pudieran brindar entonces información de, en su oportunidad específica sobre el particular de cuáles serían estas eh, leyes que estimarían que, que, que pudieran estar en esta situación y si habrían impulsado también algún mecanismo o alguna impugnación en el ámbito interno sobre el, el particular. Esta sería la información y obviamente que también eh, eh, la perspectiva del, eh, de, del eh, Estado sería fundamental. Gracias, Presidente. Um, I now invite Commissioner Vanuki for his intervention. Gracias, Presidente. Solamente para agradecer 
la presentación de las informaciones, la solicitud de esa audiencia importante, también la asistencia del Estado con sus informaciones. Y pienso que es mejor dejar mi tiempo para la relatora del país, la presidenta, y también para mi colega, el relator especial del tema. Gracias. Thank you, Commissioner Vanuki. I now invite our special rapporteur, Edison Lanzo, to make his interventions. Thank you. Plural. Um, Chair. Bueno, buenos días a todas y a todos. Gracias por eh, esta importante audiencia, las informaciones aportadas por la sociedad civil y la respuesta del Estado. Agradecemos, por supuesto, como siempre, eh, el apoyo tanto político como financiero que históricamente Estados Unidos ha, ha hecho a, a esta Relatoría de la Libertad de Expresión. Empiezo por ahí. El, el, me parece muy interesante el contexto eh, que la delegación de, del Estado acaba de mencionar sobre la importancia de la protección a la libertad de expresión y, y las prácticas, la, la protección constitucional, eh, y también la idea de, de, de ejemplo y faro para la región, que es eh, Estados Unidos en materia de libertad de expresión. Eh, y de ahí algunas de las preocupaciones levantadas por la sociedad civil, en el sentido de eh, que han eh, puesto sobre la mesa una serie de, de restricciones que eh, nos hacen ver que puede ser un momento, como siempre tienen nuestras sociedades, complejo de tensiones para el derecho a la libertad de expresión en, en, la, en Estados Unidos y obviamente nos preocupa por los ciudadanos de Estados Unidos, pero también nos preocupa esta, esta situación por eh, el ejemplo y, y que pueda, digamos, expandirse en la región de este tipo de prácticas, este, dado que, bueno, como lo demuestran nuestros informes en estos 20 años, eh, siempre Estados Unidos ha estado del lado de las buenas prácticas. Eh, cuando eh, mencionaba la delegación, este, el movimiento de derechos civiles, recordaba que la práctica que hoy en inglés se conocen como the nailing by eh, attempt, es decir, el, el arrodillarse cuando los, los jugadores de fútbol, cuando se están arrodillando hoy ante la, eh, el himno eh, de Estados Unidos, cuando se eh, toca el himno de Estados Unidos en un, en un evento, eh, fue una práctica que, que comenzó a, a realizar eh, Martin Luther King Jr., durante la década de 60 como forma de protesta eh, ante eh, los abusos notorios eh, policiales y raciales en aquella época y, y en definitiva estos, estos atletas eh, lo que hacen es traer esa tradición de, de luchar por los derechos civiles eh, bajo una forma pacífica eh, que puede gustar o no como ustedes decían a, a una parte de la población pero de eso se trata la libertad de expresión de tolerar esas formas de, de protesta pacíficas que pueden ser ofensivas para aquellos que aman su, obviamente su himno, no es que los, estos atletas no amen su himno, sino que están intentando obviamente manifestar una situación, eh, una protesta ante una situación de, que consideran de injusticia. ¿no? Entonces, eh, cuando desde las más altas esferas no se reconoce esta historia, o cuando eh, a la prensa libre, que ha sido también muy importante para Estados Unidos y la región, desde las más altas autoridades se las acusa de este, deshonestas o mentirosas en forma sistemática. Obviamente creemos que creemos en la resiliencia del pueblo de Estados Unidos y, creemos, y de sus instituciones, pero no, tenemos, no podemos dejar de apuntar de que este, digamos, nos causa preocupación. Eh, entre, otras cosas porque, entre otras cosas porque muchas veces nosotros le hemos dicho y hemos eh, tenido, eh, digamos, llamados de atención hacia gobiernos de, de América Latina y hacia presidentes que, este, digamos, no, no cuidan ese rigor que las más altas autoridades tienen que, que tener cuando se dirigen eh, a la prensa o a, a quienes ejercen la libertad de expresión. O sea, creemos que, obviamente, eh, los mandatarios, los, 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 los servidores públicos tienen derecho a ejercer la libertad de expresión, a defenderse, incluso a criticar a la prensa, pero lo hemos dicho en otros informes, cuando lo hacen tienen una obligación de hacerlo con especial cuidado en el sentido del rigor y de la veracidad de sus afirmaciones y en el sentido también de, eh, de algún modo de preservar esas libertades y de no generar un chilling effect, como se menciona en inglés, o un efecto inhibitorio en el ejercicio de, esa, de esas libertades. Entonces... Eh, del mismo modo, eh, el, el ejemplo que hoy la sociedad civil ha puesto sobre la mesa, el hecho de estar sometido a un proceso que todos esperamos, que obviamente la, la fortaleza del sistema judicial 
en Estados Unidos logre, este, digamos, desactivar esta amenaza de una prisión de 60 años por participar de una, de una protesta eh, pacífica, porque obviamente no tenemos ninguna duda de la, de la, de la afirmación que ha hecho aquí la persona que es víctima de ese, de ese juicio. Y tenemos toda la, la esperanza y la confianza de que los jueces hagan el control de constitucionalidad adecuado y dejen sin efecto esas este, acusaciones de los fiscales. Pero el hecho de estar sometido durante años a ese tipo de juicio, no, no podemos evitar de, de ver que se trata de que genere un efecto inhibitorio. Es decir, yo, eh, digamos, si tuviese eh, un hijo que quiere participar y ver lo que le pasa a otro compañero, diría, bueno, cuidado de participar en, esas, en ese tipo de, 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 de manifestaciones. Entonces eso también genera. Y, y en tercer lugar... Eh, la, la, la cantidad de leyes que se están pasando a nivel de los, de los estados. Entonces, la, la reflexión es, y, y agradezco este diálogo tan honesto que, que hemos tenido aquí, pero también el hecho de... Eh, venimos de una, de una visita oficial a, a México, junto al relator para, de Naciones Unidas para la Libertad de Expresión, ciudadano norteamericano, por cierto, David Kay, este, digamos, también gran defensor de las libertades. Y cuando veía estos problemas en algunos de los estados que ustedes mencionan, que no, no es atribuible al gobierno federal, pero se me ocurría de qué manera podemos entonces colaborar los relatores con esta situación. Eh, ¿Puede existir un diálogo con las autoridades estatales, con el Departamento de Justicia, para hacer ver este tipo de eh, aspectos que preocupan tanto a la sociedad civil como a las relatorías? Del mismo modo que, que, que concurrimos a otros países ¿Tendría bien la, la, el Estado de facilitarnos un, un diálogo en alguna instancia? ¿Podemos ser eh, un puente entre estas demandas de la sociedad civil y eh, las preocupaciones que hoy existen? Eh, dejo ahí este, estas, estas preguntas, además de, de, de aquellas informaciones que nos puedan acercar eh, adicionalmente en el correr de estos meses sobre, sobre estas informaciones que nos mencionaron. Um. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Edison. Um, I am really very concerned. Um, perhaps I missed something, but I didn't hear any specific reference to what has been happening and what has happened to the young lady in your response. And that really concerns me enormously as indeed we are concerned about what has been happening lately. I don't think anyone, unless we are the, like the three monkeys, we don't hear, we don't see, we, we don't speak, and we're buried under the sand, that there is a regression in these pillars of democracy, which we also cannot deny has not always been present in the United States, nor, is it pre nor are they present now. And, and the only way that we can assure ourselves that something is going to be done about it, to see that citizens enjoy these rights, the right to associate, the right to assemble peacefully, the right to protest, and the entire rights of freedom of expression, is by admitting that there is a regression. And there's a regression from the highest levels of power, and which it seems to be encouraged by the highest levels of power, and sometimes seems to be instigated in that way. That's the most frightening thing about it. And the most, uh, what's the expression I want? Shocking. Uh, um, aspect of it, because though you, you have had a spotty history about the right to protest and, and, and to, to, to defend and fight for one's civic rights, uh, um, ultimately you do recover and go on. But one wonders what is happening now. And I, I do wonder because I heard nothing specific about that young lady's experience. Because the criminalization of people who are protesting and exercising a right, as long as they do not engage in violence in, in the protests and in the assembly and so on, and yet they're swept up by the police and then have to face several charges, 
uh, um, um, taking up all their rights and, and, and diverting them from their life plans and maybe destroying their lives forever is unacceptable. And that is what I, I expected the answer to be focused on. But I don't think I heard anything, really, that helps us in that regard. And, and we do need information specifically in relation to the specifics which came from the civil society here. Uh, um, um, and especially the young lady's experience, and which is not singular in the recent past and since the, the inauguration day that she mentioned. Because, as you say, your media is, is there, busy reporting, even though they're accused of being fake news um, 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 producers, but they do report. And the world hears, the world witnesses. And we have witnessed what is happening in relation to protests recently, and, and we're concerned. So we would like some specifics from the state, if possible, because we need to write a report which would deal with this matter in an effective way. Um, and in the way that one would expect the United States um, as the leader of the free world to treat with its citizens' rights, especially civic rights. Because if we go back into history and the formulation of your constitution, I wonder what they are feeling now in their graves. As they say, as we say in English, there must be turning in their graves. So please, if we can hear something specific, not necessarily a fulsome reply when you come to respond, but certainly we would ask if you send us some more information and specific answers to their allegations. And now invite um, you to make your response. Um, let, 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 me, let me just check when, when we have to start the next one. Um, five minutes each. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll each side. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. I'll keep this very short. Uh, I'll preface this by saying that we're very happy to provide you more details um, uh, addressing some of the commissioner's questions in a written form after this. And and uh, I, I'm looking forward to being in communication with you about this. Um, just very briefly, and then I'll turn it over to Elizabeth so she can answer some questions around uh, the J20 protests. Um, on this question about the response to judiciary, I think you know her case presents this very clearly um, that you know the, the prosec prosecutors are given so much discretion in the United States, um, and in many ways, uh, the prosecution of these crimes is one of the, uh, the prosecution of these cases rather is uh, uh, the is the punishment or is one of the the, the 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 biggest punishments you have besides whatever the judiciary ultimately decides. And these cases can drag on for months or years um, and have these in incredible tolls on people's lives. And I think that has to be cut, kept front and center, including how to work better with prosecutors um, to make sure that they they, they understand the, the, these concerns and dangers and are and are up, are using their discretion uh, appropriately. Um, we're certainly concerned about a number of bills. I'll just highlight right now that we have a tracker online. So if you go to icnl.org and our website, there's a US protest law, uh, law tracker we, where we've tracked uh, bills uh, that have been enacted and that are being currently considered. Many of these bills are gonna be coming up in the January session um, uh, and will be reconsidered again. And we're expecting some more of these laws to pass. Um, and I do wanna emphasize you know, uh, that uh, I think there's a real role here for the State Department, for uh, for the Commission, to be engaging with other parts of the federal government, um, with state and local government on this set of issues, um, to explain these concerns, both about concerns about what impact this has within the United States, um, but also what how impact this has um, abroad when people can look at the United States and say, look, you're doing this here. Um, why should we be listening to the United States' voice on these issues? And I, and I think it's really undermining uh, the mission. But I want to preserve most of my time here. Thanks. 
Um, I, I also want to reiterate that point that in many of these cases, the prosecutions are the punishment and that um, in, in many cases, um, depending on which estimate you're looking at, um, upwards of 90% of US criminal cases um, are resolved in a plea deal. Um, and I think that that is a, um, a common tactic to over-prosecute in hopes of getting an easy resolution, an easy win, if you will. Um, in, in our case, with the J-20 cases, as they're often called, um, we've been charged with multiple felonies. Um, I'm currently under indictment for um, felony inciting a riot, a misdemeanor for engaging in a riot, a misdemeanor for conspiracy to engage in a riot, um, and then there are, are several property destruction charges that they don't allege I physically did or asked anyone to do necessarily, just that they're part of a conspiracy, a broad conspiracy um, narrative. And um, they have over and over again basically pushed this idea that if you were part of a group, that it was the group that was the danger. They've said those exact words. It's the group that is the danger. So that's a very concerning paradigm when it's groups that protest. It's groups that start social movements. And that's where my concern is, aside from the desire not to go to prison. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll just briefly make a few remarks regarding freedom of expression. We share the commissioner's um, concerns as well as the special rapporteur's concerns over the situation for freedom of expression and free press in the US. One thing that civil society has documented is the increase in harmful speech against media workers and against media outlets and how this has created um, greater public distrust in the media, which is important to have a pluralistic media that, that the public can rely on and can turn to for sources, of uh, for sources of information, but now there's a widening bridge between the public and the media. And also, um, how journalists are being attacked and threatened, arbitrarily arrested for covering protests and being, um, and basically doing their jobs to bring this information to the wider public. So we definitely share your concerns over um, threats to freedom of expression in the U.S. Um, the state. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. And I first would like to emphasize that the United States welcomes this dialogue, and we welcome the offers for collaboration. Um, we believe no democracy is perfect, and there are always opportunities to improve, particularly in this area. Um, that being said, and referring specifically, um, Commissioner McCauley, to your questions. It is um, important to emphasize again that we're here as part of a thematic hearing under Article 66 of the Commission's Rules of Procedure. And therefore, um, since this is not a petitioned-based hearing, we are not in the position to discuss an individual case, particularly one that is still under litigation. Um, our system remains robust, and we remain confident in it. And um, with that, we look forward to continuing this dialogue with both civil society, um, within our own society, and within our own departments, and also, of course, with the commissioners. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sorry if I, I mis um, misstated the position. I really didn't mean that we should usually reply to the specifics of her singular case, because she was swept up with about 200 people. But the general situation when that happens of the criminalization of people involved in protests in the last cop, um, in the last, well, it's not quite a year yet, uh, almost a year and a little bit before, yes. Anyway, um, what, what um, um, if I could request this from both sides to please send us um, further information as as you have reminded all of us, and I did mention this is a, a, a hearing, a thematic hearing, um, is um, also if you can give um, some specific information as to the charges, some journalists who have been charged or criminalized in any way and who have been detained in any way. And in relation to, to um, electronic um, surveillance. surveillance plus, um, if um, 
if, if uh, electronic um, personal in the electronic um, what is what is uh, smartphones. Device. Smartphone, device. but devices. That's device. the word I wanted. Not only smartphones, but other things. If if uh, you have specifics about police um, um, taking them without a warrant uh, um, and so on, and using um, uh, contents or uh, uh, invading the privacy um, um, laws and rights, and also um, to more as much specificity as you can give us in relation to all the cases and the protests that you know about, which, which in which the police acted with excessive violence um, and, and the results thereby. And in fact, any other information you think will be useful for our report. Um, with that, I thank both sides and as usual, the helpful position from the State Department and also for being here present and speaking on this issue, which is so fundamental to all of us who believe in, in democratic uh, principles and in, in a de democratic form of government. And um, to civil society, thank you very much for bringing this matter to us. It is very, very vital to the work of the Commission. Thank you. This hearing is at an end. 15, 15.